Well, good morning and welcome again to our midweek lesson. We've been looking at discipleship evangelism. And we've, looked, we've been looking at the foundational stones of discipleship. And one of the things is meditating on the Word of God. This is what God spoke to Joshua. And he said, you shall meditate on this book, talking about the Bible, talking about the first five books of the Bible. That's all they had at that point. You shall meditate on it day and night, and then you'll be successful, and then you'll make your way prosperous. So if we want to prosper, and if we want to be successful, if we want to thrive in this world, then we need to meditate on God's Word. So this deals with how to meditate on God's Word. How do you go about meditation? Now this lesson is given to us by Don Crow. And again, this is taken from Karis Bible College in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And it, the founder and president of Karis is Andrew Womack. And this is one of the instructors there at Karis Bible College. As he is teaching us, how do we go about meditating on God's Word? This is very important. This is what God said that we are to do. So not only did God tell Joshua to do this, but in Psalm chapter 1, if you read that, it says the same thing, that we are to meditate on the Word of God. It is very important that we know what the Word of God is. That's the problem with our world today is because there's a lack of biblical knowledge. So if you don't know the Bible, then how can you have a biblical worldview? If you don't read and study the Bible, <clears throat> then you're just listening to the world around you and you're listening to what other people say, or you're listening to what you think, but what we need to know, if we want to be successful, and if we want to thrive in this world, we need to meditate <clears throat> on the Word of God. So Don begins by defining what meditation is, what it means to meditate. Well, it's defined as to muse over or to ponder, or to plan in the mind, to purpose, or intend. Now the Greek word implies to revolve something around in the mind. So you're just spinning it around and around in your mind. You take a word, you chew on it. I've heard that uh, that's another way of defining what it means to meditate on something. Is just take it like a cow would chew its cud. I think that's the root or the meaning uh, of the word to meditate. It's just to chew on it, to think about it, to just eat it. You know, that's another way of describing how you meditate on the word of God. There were times that God told the prophets to take this scroll and eat it. What they were supposed to do is just meditate on it. They were to chew on it, to revolve it around in their mind, regurgitate it and chew on it some more, and regurgitate it and chew on it some more. We never uh, get enough. I mean, the Word of God is so rich and powerful, and sometimes we read it and it just doesn't click with us what it's talking about. But we keep thinking about it and pondering it and meditating on it, spinning it around in our mind. And then all of a sudden it's like the light bulb goes off in our mind and we say, oh yeah, that's what it means. Now there's two reasons, as Don says, for uh, biblical meditation. One is to ponder over correct knowledge also referred to as renewing the mind. This is what it says in Romans. The Apostle Paul wrote about this, that we're to renew our minds. And 
to do that we have to make sure that we have the correct information that we're putting into our mind you know it's like the old adage garbage in garbage out number two Another reason for biblical meditation is to contact God behind his word. You've got the word, but what is God? I mean, how can we connect with God through this word that he's given to us? You see, this is one of the primary ways that God speaks to us is through his word. You know, in John chapter 1 it said, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Talking about Jesus. That was his name before he came to this world. He was known as the Word. So the Word, in the beginning was the Word. That was Jesus, who we call Jesus. That was his name. He is the Word. He is the word that came to life and dwelt among us. So not only did we have something written down on stone or paper, but now we have a word that's in flesh. He's saying this is God's word. I am God's word. Listen to my words. Listen to what I say. So we want to get in touch with God Behind the word, how do we do that? Through prayer, praise, and meditation. Or, for example, musing, pondering, thinking about him. And we think about him because, you know, in Isaiah it says that his ways are not our ways. Our thoughts are not his thoughts. And that's true. His ways are higher than our ways. And his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So to get in touch with him, we need to get in touch with his word. What is he communicating to us through the word of God? Through not only the written word, but through the word made flesh, through Jesus. Now, as Don goes on to say, medica meditation, <laughs> meditation can be done from topical study. So what does that mean? What that means is that you choose a topic that you want to think about. An example he gives is baptism. So how would you go about studying, doing a topical study? Well, number one, you would want to define the word baptism. And you'd want to go to the Greek and the Hebrew or a good dictionary and find out what baptism means. You want to find the root word from which it is derived, especially in Hebrew or Greek. You want to know where it came from, what it spun off of, if you will. And you want to consider and ponder the context of the verses. So you just don't want to take one sentence or just one word. You want to see what was said around it in the paragraph. And that may lead you to a study of other related subjects as well, such as remission of sins or repentance or faith or the conscience or calling on the Lord. So you take those topics and you'd want to just delve into it and see, well, what does this mean? What do these words mean? And you need to ponder questions that you might have or even the questions that the scripture raises such as are there qualifications to be met before a person is baptized what's the purpose of baptism when was it practiced in what time frame now also meditation can be done from expositional study and what that means it's just a verse-by-verse verse study of a book of the Bible. Now, this is the type of study that I like to do, is a verse-by-verse verse study of the book, book of the Bible. To take it verse-by-verse verse and find out, to think about it, to ponder 
over that book for so long that you become familiar with its content. And some, I, I would, if you're just starting out, I'd take a smaller book, maybe some of Paul's letters like Philippians or uh, Colossians or um, Galatians or one of those, and just become familiar with the entire content of that book so that you can put everything into context. Now, Don says that meditation can be done through word studies. For example, what do certain words mean? For example, what does it mean to believe? Or what does the word Lord mean? Or what does the word Jesus mean? We, sometimes we don't think about that. But in the Hebrew, words were very important and names were very important. Name A name really characterized or epitomized a person. It really got to the heart of who that person was. So when we say Jesus, <clears throat> and the Hebrew word is Yeshua, so his Hebrew name is Yeshua, and we've translated that into English as Jesus, but his Hebrew name the name that he would have been called by during the New Testament time would be Yeshua. So what does that name mean? Or what does the word Christ mean? What does that word mean? <clears throat> or what does the word justify mean? So you can go on and on and on, but just learning what the different terms or terminology or words, what do they actually mean? How are they defined? Don't just think, well, I think it means that. No, look it up and find out for yourself the true meaning of it. Also, you can med meditate on paragraphs in the Bible. A paragraph, as you know, is a unit of thought in writing. It usually contains several sentences and when an author changes the subject or the emphasis in his writing or their writing they usually begin a new paragraph so by understanding just taking the entire paragraph paragraph together helps you to understand the context of the words that are being used and you can get a better understanding of what it means. Now also when you're meditating through scriptures we need to look for punctuation such as question marks. We have to ask well why is this question being asked? And how does this question relate to the context in which it is written? So biblical meditation is not just looking at words but you want to look for God behind those words. You want to get to know God, in other words. How do we get to know God? What is he saying to us? This is one way that we come to know the Lord. This is one way that we come to know Yahweh. Who is he? It's by reading his words and seeing what those words how they are describing the character the nature of God so we get to our question and answer section and Don asks what does the word meditate mean what does the word meditate mean well it means to muse over to ponder, or to revolve something around in one's mind. In other words, you're just spinning it around over and over and over and over again in your mind. Okay, I read this word. Now I'm going to think about it. Now I've looked up definitions. I've looked at the context. So now I'm just going to think about it. What does it really mean? What is God saying? Now, 
the next question that Don asked is, what are two reasons for biblical meditation? Well, number one, to ponder correct knowledge so that we can renew our mind. You know, that we get the right information. As I said before, garbage in, garbage out. So we need to make sure that we have the correct information. And number two, <clears throat> the second reason for biblical meditation is to get in touch with God behind his word. How do we do that? By musing, pondering, and thinking about him. What is he trying to say to us? The next question that Don asks is, what is a topical study? Well, that's choosing a topic, like we said before about baptism, for example. Some topic from the Bible to study and think upon. So you can look, you can study the Bible in that uh, way, if you so choose. You take a top, uh, topic. Maybe it's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Maybe it's uh, uh, salvation. What does that mean? Or maybe it's, um, you know, what does the resurrection mean? So you take a certain topic from the Bible and you start studying it and you look for scriptures that are related and see what they, you know, from what I've learned from listening to a rabbi, his name is Rabbi David Foreman, he always talks about when you see a certain word in the scripture, See if there's a link to it somewhere else in the Bible. See if there's another place in the Bible where you see that word. And if there is, then that means that there is a link to it. So you'd want to read the context of that word in those different locations. For example, if it's in Genesis, and then you find that same word over in Deuteronomy, well, Rabbi Foreman says there's possibly a link between them. So what is God saying to us by using the same words? Now, since we have so many translations in English, we lose a lot of that ability to trace those links because one scripture, one translation will use a certain word versus another translation will use another synonym for that same word and you lose the link. But in the Hebrew, you keep the same words. You don't change from one, well, I think I'll use this word this time instead of that. No, you use the same word. That way you can see definitely that there is a link between those words. So if you were using a Hebrew Bible, you could, you could do those links and see, well, look at the context of how that word is used in Genesis versus how it's used in Deuteronomy. And what is God trying to teach us as a result? That's just one way that you can do it. What is an expositional study of the scriptures? Well, an expositional study is a verse-by-verse -verse study of a book of the Bible. So you just take it verse-by-verse. -verse. Now again, I believe that you also need in this, you have to make sure that you're studying it in context with the verses around it. If it's in the same grouping, in the same paragraph to give it a better understanding of what the meaning is. Now Don says, read Luke 6.46, and what do you think the word Lord means? So Luke 6.46 says, And why call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? So in this context, you would say, well, a Lord is someone who has authority and they're someone that can tell you what to do. And if they're Lord, you need to obey them. 
So that's, if, if you read just that one verse, that's what Lord is suggesting that it means. It means someone in authority who has the right to tell you what to do and that you need to obey them. All right, read Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. What do you think the word Jesus means? In Matthew 1, 21, it says, And she shall bring forth a son. This is Gabriel the angel talking to Mary. You shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. I'm sorry. This is the angel Gabriel talking to Joseph, telling him what the name of the child should be. She shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So from this scripture, the name Jesus, what do you think it means? Well, the angel says that he will save his people from their sins. If you look in the Hebrew, his name Yeshua, it means God is salvation. God is salvation. So that's the meaning of of the word or the name Jesus. God is salvation. Read Luke 23 verses 1 and 2. What do you think the word Christ means? Well, Luke 23 verses 1 and 2 says, And the whole multitude of them arose and led him unto Pilate. And they be began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ a king. Well, we know from the Old Testament that a king was anointed by a prophet. For example, Samuel was the one that anointed Saul to be the first king of Israel. Then later, when God rejected Saul, Samuel went to David and anointed him to be king. So the word Christ means the anointed one. Anointed for a particular purpose, for, to fulfill a particular role, for example. So you could be anointed as prophet, priest, or king in those positions, but you were chosen and you were anointed by God for those positions. So Christ means the anointed one. Now, what is a paragraph? Well, if in English, you know that that's a unit of thought in writing. They're grouped together, sentences that are grouped together because they contain the same thought. And it's just explaining or expounding on the same thought. Biblical meditation is not just looking at words, but for what? Well, the answer is contacting or getting in touch with God behind his word. That's what it means to meditate on the word of God. It's getting in touch with God. <clears throat> getting in touch with God's thoughts. Getting in touch with the mind of Christ. With the mind of the Lord. What is, you know, what is what does it mean to have the mind of Christ? Well, it's to know what God's thoughts are. You know, if you know God's thoughts, you know who God is. God is love. If he tells you, I don't want this person to die and go to hell. I care about this person. That's when, when God says that he doesn't want any to perish. Why? It's because of his love. He made us. 
and he doesn't want to see anyone die and go to hell. He didn't make hell for us. He made it for the devil and his demons. But the devil says, well, if I'm going, I'm going to take everybody with me. <laughs> but this, in a nutshell, is what it means on uh, this. This is how you go about meditating on God's words. These are some techniques, some ideas, some thoughts, some suggestions of how you can meditate on God's word. But like I said, the word meditate means to chew on it. It's like chewing the cud. You just chew it over and over and over again. You regurgitate it. You bring it back up and you go over it again. And you just think about it. You ponder it. And then you do word studies. And then you look at the context in, when it's w in which it is written. You look at words. You look at key words and see if they're somewhere else. And what is the link between those words? And does that give you a fuller understanding <coughs> of what that word means and what God is trying to get at? <coughs> it is so important. That's why God told Joshua, you need to meditate on this word day and night. If you want to be successful, if you want to be prosperous, that's what you need to do. And I heard uh, from um, his name left me. But anyway, one of the, the most uh, familiar leaders in the, um, the Christian world his son said that his father, every day, he would read from the Proverbs. And he asked his dad, why do you do that? You keep reading it over and over and over again. And he says, well, these are words from one of the wisest men on the face of the earth. Don't you think that I need to gain wisdom, the wisdom that they had, and I need to apply it? in my life, if I want to be successful, if I want to uh, achieve what the Lord wants me to achieve, don't you think that we need wisdom? I need all the wisdom I can get. So I, I heard that Billy Graham, that he said what he did every day was to read chapters from Psalms, I think three chapters out of Psalms every day, or five, excuse me, five chapters every day out of the Psalms and one chapter from Proverbs every day. That was just part of his biblical um, daily study was to do that. Five chapters out of the book of Psalms and one chapter out of Proverbs. So that's part of what I do as well. I do uh, a one-year Bible study where it takes you through the Bible in a one-year's time. I do that. But I also do, like I said, the five chapters in Psalms and the one chapter in Proverbs every day because we need the wisdom of God. You know, this is how we are wise. This is how we can be prosperous. This is how we can thrive in the world in which we live. So, however you want to do the study, the thing is, these are just some ideas, some suggestions, some techniques that you can use in trying to read, study, and meditate on the Word of God. It is so important. God stressed this. So, if God stressed that we should do this, you know, the psalmist said, Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. And the word is sharp and powerful than any two-edged sword. And that it's one of the pieces of armor that we have that Paul describes in Ephesians chapter 6. The sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. That should be part of our toolbox. <laughs> that
that we need to know the word of God if we're to do spiritual warfare. So I just pray that this will help you as you read and study the word of God, that you would use meditation to think about it, to ponder on it, to swirl it around in your mind, to renew your mind. Don't listen to the world, but listen to the Word of God if you want to have a blessed life. So God bless you as you study the Word of God.